Are you looking to simplify your investments? Check out BMO ETFs. Your asset allocation can have a major impact on whether you will meet your financial goals. So it's no wonder Canadian investors are turning to asset allocation ETFs to complement their portfolios. BMO offers easy to use solutions such as the BMO Growth ETF, BMO Balance ETF, BMO All Equity ETF, and more. These ETFs invest in a number of underlying index-based ETFs and are rebalanced automatically. What was once a popular mutual fund strategy is now available through an ETF with the introduction of the T6 units. T6 units provide a 6% annual payout on a monthly basis, helping retirees meet their cash flow needs. This is available on their balanced and growth asset allocation ETFs. Regular rebalancing means you can spend less time planning your life and more time living it. Learn more at bmoetfs.com. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that this information discussed today is not intended to be or construed as investment advice. Please consult a professional advisor before putting a loony in any of these financial markets. The dirty secret is that no one's ever going to get paid after have the shortest memories when it comes to investment. We just got to get Keith into Bitcoin. Hey, there's a bubble. Welcome back to Looney Hour episode 86. As always, joined by the three amigos. We've got Keith Dicker, Ice Cap Asset Management, and Rich Diaz of Acorn Macro Consulting. Welcome back to the show. Gentlemen, Keith, what's going on, buddy? You've shed the Patagucci this week. Yeah, I know. It's actually warmed up here. Uh, I think a lot of people know by now we, we've, we've had... Keith, what's going on over there, buddy? You shed your Patagucci jacket. You're struggling with your microphone. Yeah. You know, this is one of these, if people could see that the startup of the loony hour beforehand, they would say, yeah, it, it is a bit of a shit show here sometimes when we're doing it. Uh, but on, on a serious note, you know, we, we've had a serious week here in Nova Scotia. We, we have these forest fires. Uh, we, I think there's about 15,000 people have been displaced from their homes. Um, hearing, I might be wrong with the number, but up to or in excess of 200 homes have, have been lost. So it's it's pretty serious what's been happening. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's I think we're almost out. We're supposed to get a lot of rain starting tomorrow for a week, but it's been a struggle for people here in Nova Scotia the week. That's it. I got nothing wow. else to really. You went from. Uh... everyone. Had a Gucci jacket inside the house to forest fires. Yeah, and it has an effect. If you know Halifax, it hasn't f- affected the peninsula. So, uh, but it's sort of in the outside areas. But there we go. How about you, Rich? What's going on over your way? Oh, geez, hey, uh, I don't know. Nothing much. Definitely not as exciting as that, or as horrible. Um, no, London's like full bloom. It's the sun is up and out, and everyone's just having a great time. Um, I've got nothing to report. Really, had an easy week. Haven't hurt myself at the gym. Knock on wood. And uh, yeah, just just uh, just cruising. Ready to talk macro with you guys. Looking forward to it. Pints every day. Pints every day. That's right. Hope I'm, hopefully my mom skipped that bit. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's been it's been great, man. It's been great. Oh, my Steve. godson learned how to walk. There you go. That's that's the news of the week. <laughs> and Steve, what about your way? What's going on west? Not much, man. Sun's shining. No forest fires here yet, knock on wood. So, uh, yeah, we're Kitsilano's looking uh, alive and well. The king of Kitsilano. Okay, so tell us about today. We have a special day for everyone, right? We do have a special day. We've got, uh, well, Rich, why don't you tee up our our guests coming onto the show? All right, cool. So um, as many Canadians probably have heard, or hopefully they've heard, um, a Bill C-11 uh, is come, uh, has been, you know, I think it's a rather controversial bill. Um, it's commonly known as the online streaming act. It's been introduced by this parliament after they tried to introduce it last parliament. Um, we've joked about it. Um, we've talked about it. We've touched on it and alluded to it. And I figured it would be important to have an expert come on and talk to us, talk to us about it. And, and more generally what his views on sort of free speech, um, censorship, what this government's doing, uh, and maybe even talk about what other governments and 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 um, and parliaments are doing all over the world. Um, his name is Michael Allen Geis, a professor um, at University of Ottawa. He has more degrees than I think the three of us combined. But um, I've heard him before, and he's pretty cool, and he can explain to us explain to us a pretty complicated subject, and hopefully some uh, some simple term, simple ways. And and yeah, we'll just have a quick chat with him about uh, digital policy, digital rights, and et cetera, et cetera. So there you go. So he'll he'll be coming on soon, hopefully, and uh, okay. and yeah, we'll 
So Not speaking of degrees, uh, university degrees, 30 years ago, uh, last month, I graduated from university. Oh, wow. Did Jeez. you actually, did you actually look at the calendar and you, you actually figured that out? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Try to count like that with your fingers. No, you know, you, you know, one great thing about when you go away to school, you know, you make some great friends along the way. So there's always some joker out there, you know, they'll send you a, uh, a, a pop up on MySpace or something like that. To You're say, still hey, on there, you know? eh? You're the last guy. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, what school? Where did you actually go to school? I went that's to Memorial. Trivia. That's going be like a trivia for the Looney Hour listeners. Yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So I went to Memorial. Uh, Rich, where did you go? McGill, of course. Keith, where is that? Memorial is in Newfoundland, in St. John's. Man. Some bulldoze yeah. now, eh? Yeah, like yeah. a four minute cab ride to, to George Street and, you know, uh, everywhere like that. So let's just study Keith. Chat a, let, let's, uh, I think we have about five minutes, right? Before uh, Mr. Geist comes on. What else we got today, guys? We had a big bet coming up, correct? Yeah, we've got that's a, right. uh, yeah, well, let's, let's, we'll just preview it. So we're going to, we're going to jump to the interview here in a few, but uh, just kind of preview if you want to. You know, if you don't want to hear about Bill C-11, by all means, feel free to fast forward and skip over our guests. It's kind of rude, but uh, we'll allow it. Um, you know, we're going to chat about Canada's GDP. That's the huge hot button topic of the week. Obviously, this is co prompting calls now from some of the large bank economists to say, hey, you know, more rate hikes coming here, imminent uh, housing markets going to crash again. Uh, so we're going to get into that. We've got some population growth numbers. We've got a bunch of rhetoric coming out of the Fed. Uh, a lot of a lot of jobs and labor data uh, as, as well from the U.S. Some some stuff that's going on in Europe. So there's, there's honestly like a lot to chat about. So uh, we'll keep our conversation uh, here on Bill C11 relatively brief. But we thought it was important to bring our guest on uh, because we do think uh, you know the show is all about enlightening uh, and enhancing the conversation in Canada. Again, just having, I think, a healthy dialogue. And so we wanted to bring on our guests to hopefully shed some light on what this means for Canadians moving forward. And of course, what this means for the Looney Hour. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, the Looney Hour continues to be able to hit the airwaves here. And um, so we're going to jump to our guest right now. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks for uh, jumping on the Looney Hour here. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Rich right, has well, got um, some yeah, questions teed up for you. I got loads of questions. So, um, Michael, I, I just uh, I just want to embarrass you a little bit. You went to Western Cambridge and Columbia, so that's amazing. Um, you're obviously a professor in law. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself for some of us who may not know you, um, and then and sort of what you've been working on specifically about Bill C11, and then we'll ask you some questions from there. If that's okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, of course, happy to. So, uh, as you mentioned, I'm a law professor at the University of Ottawa. I hold the Canada Research Chair in Internet and E-commerce Law, and you know, I often describe the work that I do sort of at the intersection between law, technology, and policy. Uh, and so that's meant getting engaged in a pretty broad range of issues over, frankly, the last couple of decades, whether that's privacy rules, intellectual property, and copyright-related issues, uh, or more recently, a lot of internet regulation-related concerns. It used to be around things like net neutrality and the like, and, and more recently, it's around proposals like Bill C-11, Bill C-18, the government online news bill. And I think we can anticipate coming up pretty soon an online safety or online harms bill that's going to touch on some of these issues, too. Um, I've been a kind of a, yeah, secretly or not so secretly been reading your blog for a while now. You have some really, really sharp views on Bill C-11. Um, why? I mean, obviously, you're interested in many, many things. Um, you know, you have lots of books, so clearly you read quite a bit. But my question is more just the, why does this really get you? Why, do, why does this in particular um, not aggravate you maybe is the wrong term, but uh, spark your interest as someone of your, you know, um, intellectual prowess, let's say. And 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 why do you think it's important for Canadians and our, our listeners generally to, to sort of pay attention to? And and um, yeah, if you could just go go ahead in that one. Yeah, it's a fun question. You know, I guess I, I'd start by saying, you know, I've generally have been for a long time now really interested and concerned with some of the the, the approaches that we've seen, frankly, from both parties, I don't think it's a partisan issue uh, that they've taken with respect to the Internet. I can think back to the the Harper years and concerns around lawful access and surveillance and, and some of the other proposals that uh, were coming out of that government. And I was quite critical at that time as well. Uh, more recently, we've seen with the current government uh, an, an increased emphasis on right on different kinds of Internet regulation. And while I certainly don't think that the Internet is a, a no law land, I think it's appropriate to have regulation. Some of the kinds of proposals that have been put forward, I think, raise some real concerns. And 
In the case of Bill C-11, you know, it, it actually started life as a prior bill, Bill C-10. Uh, when it was first introduced, I, I had some doubts about it. It was focused, as the government said, primarily on large streaming services like Netflix and Disney and others. And and I didn't think that the government had made a particularly compelling case for some of the regulations that they were proposing. But, you know, if, if I'm honest about it, I, I appear before committee, I raised some of those objections or concerns, but didn't get a whole lot of traction. And it was only once the, the government removed one of the safeguards that they'd initially put in the bill, a safeguard around whether or not uh, our broadcast regulator, the CRTC, would be empowered to establish certain regulations with respect to user content, that the issue took off, to be sure, both politically and I think in the public's mind, and that, you know, I, I doubled down in the sense that I got extremely involved and have been now for quite some time on this issue. Uh, part of it, because I think it really does go to the very heart of expression online. I do think that there's just, you know, so many of us that now express ourselves this way in the way that we might have previously written a letter or sent a fax or um, email or whatever it happens to be. This is how we often participate culturally, politically, um, commercially, whatever, whatever it happens to be. And, you know, we need to be cautious about the sort of regulatory models that get established. And then just to, to get close, when the government denies that that's what it's doing, uh, which, you know, has been, I think, just this ongoing gaslighting initiative almost where the minister says, Bill doesn't do this. Everyone who looks at it, uh, even the chair of the CRTC and others say that it does. They look for some kind of solutions to try to provide safeguards and, and comfort that that's not the intent. That's not what's going to happen. And even when we did get some of that coming out of the Senate, the government still rejects it. You know, I, I suppose that 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 it just it does more than pique my interest. I think it genuinely angers me and and frustrates me uh, as someone who is a believer in a, in policy processes and thinks that if you put forward compelling arguments, uh, that someone's going to listen. And this has been one of these instances where um, that hasn't worked, um, at least with respect to how the government has approached this bill. I just had to, so, to, so when, to clarify. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, Rich, I got to. Is it? Do they have, does the CRTC basically have the authority in their sole discretion to say they are going to be sort of the dictators of what is factual and what isn't? So, for example, if somebody puts out, you know, a piece of content that they're like, well, that that to us is is not factual news or factual information, and they can basically request, you know, YouTube or something to pull that content down. Is that correct? No, I don't think it is. Um, and 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 I, but I think the question highlights a couple of the challenges that have arisen with respect to this this debate around both this bill and more broadly around internet regulation. I think there's been a lot of overstatement, quite frankly, about um, what the bill does and doesn't do. But even more, I mean, I think your question goes to the heart of what a lot of people would like these bills to do. A lot of people do want to at least see if they they may be uncomfortable with the CRTC making these decisions, but they are concerned about misinformation and disinformation, and so. There's this almost natural evolution where you think if the government is going to step in and regulate, well, surely it's going to deal with misinformation and disinformation. And we get that in the context of C-11. We get it in the context of C-18, the news bill, where part of the argument is if we force Google and Facebook to pay for links somehow, that's going to help address the uh, misinformation or disinformation concerns. And we'll get it with online safety as well, where I think people will expect that part of what the government might want to structure around trying to make the Internet a safer place is to deal with disinformation. And here's the thing. None of those bills will deal with misinformation. It's very unlikely they will deal with disinformation because at the end of the day, much of this is expression that is protected. Now, we might get into something that deals specifically with disinformation where there is an intent to deceive and cause harm. We could, I could envision a world in which the government said we want to have some rules around that. Uh, but that's not certainly what these uh, with these bills do, and it's unlikely to be what we find uh, in this bill. And so there is a bit of a disconnect between what people uh, think is in this bill and what is in it, and even more what people think the government ought to be doing about some of the harms that take place online and what it's actually doing. Secure your digital life. Did you know anytime you surf the internet, your data is exposed to data brokers? These companies collect your personal information and sell them to businesses for marketing purposes. Data brokers collect your personal information and profit off of it at the expense of your privacy. Let Incogni help you take back control of your data, reduce spam, and prevent scam attacks by opting you out of their databases automatically. Incogni doesn't only remove your data from certain kinds of data brokers, risk mitigation, recruitment, people search sites, financial information, and marketing data brokers. Incogni removes your personal information from them all. 
Looney Hour listeners get an exclusive 60% discount by visiting incogni.com slash Looney Hour. And now, back to the show. Professor Geist, uh, can you give us an example then? Because right now we're talking in, in generals and a lot of people are sort of thinking, hey, what can I do or what I cannot do or something like that. But give us an example. And then I, I think one of the biggest critiques right now, uh, you know, people that are, you know, in this world that we are in, I think it's amazing and outstanding that we're able to create a podcast and have really great conversations with everyone outside of the mainstream media, you know, sphere. Um, but if you go back, like specifically uh, when, when COVID began, and back then, a lot of questions and ideas and thoughts that were raised, if they didn't go with the narrative that what the mainstream media was promoting, I mean, we, everyone was shut down. That, that That's what happened. And obviously, as time went on, it became factual that, yeah, that that thought was was actually accurate. So an example of that would be. Um, originally when COVID was originated, it said, uh, it was, some people said, Hey, this was created in a lab and you were immediately shut down for that. So using that as kind of an example, is, is this a bill that can, where, you know, the government is all of a sudden deciding they are the arbiter of truth. They're the ones that are allowed to let us know if we have, you know, acceptable or unacceptable views. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I guess I would say, I, I mean, I understand why that's people's concerns. I don't think that's the intent or the expectation of where the CRTC is going to go, if I'm honest about it. I don't think this is about deciding what is truthful or not. This is more about culture related dimensions that may have an impact on some of those issues. And so when you highlight the the role of alternative media, of podcasts, of others, I have a podcast as well, Law Bites, that uh, also tries to, to provide you know, different perspectives that you don't typically see within the mainstream media. Um, I do think that they will be affected, uh, although the government keeps insisting that that's not the case. And the reason for that is the CRTC's powers when it comes to online content coming out of C11 are much more about the, the its ability to, to pressure or indeed force some of the large platforms to either prioritize or buy by a definition, almost deprioritize certain kinds of content. So it's not casting judgment on the specifics of any individual piece of content. But what it is doing is saying, we want to ensure that certain kinds of content, particular Canadian content, however you define that, and that's one of the challenges in this bill, um, that becomes prioritized. And what we've seen from many in the digital creator space and others is concern that once you get a regulator making some of those calls, telling a TikTok or a YouTube uh, or a Spotify that that some of this content needs to be elevated in the algorithm, in effect, other stuff will, by definition, be uh, deprioritized, that, that that will have serious ramifications for many people, the way they make a living, for their ability to be heard. What, what I what I told the, the Senate committee and the House committee when I when I appeared on this bill is that I think it's a mistake to think that the bill uh, has an, has implications for what people can say. I think people can say whatever they want to say with or without this bill within the confines of the law. But what this bill does have implications for is your ability to be heard. And I think that's an important part of expression as well. You know, I think, you know, if your audience suddenly started declining significantly because for whatever reason, there were other programs that were prioritized simply because of the way this kind of regulatory fallout played out um that that would have a real world impact obviously for you and for for others who you know who follow what you do and you know i think the government getting into the that sort of business of prioritizing or deprioritizing content raises certain risks the government even further as part of this bill and the crtc has been pretty explicit about it uh taking the starting position that Canadian law will regulate all audiovisual content anywhere in the world. It's all streamers. It's streamers that target Canada. It's other streamers as well. Now, the idea will be that they will establish some thresholds that will exclude some of those. But it strikes me as, well, rather loony, so to speak, that uh, you would have uh, you, you'd have a Canadian law saying our starting point is that it's all subject to Canadian law. And in fact, we just had the CRTC as it begins to try to flesh out this legislation, say that it wants these discoverability rules, this idea of prioritizing or deprioritizing Canadian content to apply not just in Canada, but worldwide. So that somehow Netflix or some of these other services have to prioritize Canadian content, not just in Canada, but in Korea, in India, in South Africa. I mean, in, in all these other countries. And if we get there, 
you know, and other countries begin to emulate that same approach, does that mean what we begin to see in our feeds are the result of cultural regulation from countries around the world, as opposed to reflecting your actual interests with companies trying to ensure that they provide you with the kind of content that you're interested in, so you keep subscribing? So in very short summary, what you're basically saying is the government wants to essentially be able to control the dials on the algorithm and say, this is what we want to be prioritized. We think we know better than YouTube on what you should be looking at, or you're scrolling on your TikTok and, and the TikTok algorithm says, well, you like dogs, so we're going to show you all these dog videos, but their, their algorithm is saying, you know, you know, the Canadian government is going to say, this is how we think the algorithm should be spitting out. Yeah. So, and, and I think a lot of people have taken that, that at the end of the day, that's practically what the bill does uh, or in effect. Now the, the government keeps insisting that's not what they're doing. They say that, listen, the CRTC can't tell, uh, let's say YouTube to change their algorithm. They deal, the CRTC says in outcomes rather than in algorithmic specifics. But the, to me, that's largely a distinction without a difference. I mean, to, to tell YouTube what we want to ensure is that people see more Canadian content in their feeds and you figure out how you do that. Um, but we aren't going to tell you that you have to change your algorithm. I mean, what else are you saying? You're saying, in effect, that you do have to change your algorithm. And I think most people recognize that that's where many of the risks are. Now, this, as I say, is not necessarily about political viewpoints. I don't think it is. I think it is more fundamentally about culture. Although I will say that for those that, you know, that are deeply concerned about where could this go, um, the reality is that, that the legislation itself speaks not only about discoverability from the cultural perspective, but talks about the ability to, for the CRTC to establish rules associated with what they would call programs, which is essentially all this audiovisual content. So to come back to the question of, you know, what happens when you get certain kinds of speech that is seen as, as harmful to society. And so people say, listen, we're not going to allow you to say this, or we don't want this aired more publicly. Is it possible that we could see the CRTC say, we want to establish warning labels on certain kinds of videos or content, not specific videos, but saying, generally speaking, we find this genre or this these kinds of videos potentially harmful. We think there needs to be some kind of warning label, other sort of issue, uh, so, other sort of regulation with the way it's presented. At least theoretically, the the power is there to do that. So, I, so what I'm hearing is that they're going to throttle all, um, all other financial and economic uh, podcasts, and they're going to throttle up the Looney Hour. And so, on that basis, I've now changed my view. I'm now pro Bill C11. Uh, no, I'm, I'm obviously kidding. Um, one of the other subjects that I know is close, uh, near and dear to your heart is sort of the competition in telecommunications industry. And um, some, I mean, so I, I mean, Canada has abysmal productivity growth, um, partly I think as a function of the fact that we are dominated by oligopolies in energy, banking, um, definitely the groceries industry, and certainly the telecommunications industry. Recently, there's been the merger between Shaw and Rogers. Um, I know you have a view on this. Can you just tell us just, if, I mean, I know it's a bit sidetracked from Bill C-11, but I think it's important and a, it follows on from a previous discussion we've had on the Looney Hour. Can you just give us your view on that and, and whether you think that's going to result in higher prices for phones or lower prices for phones and telephony services? <laughs> yeah, sure. So I want to I want to come to that, but I do want to quickly, if you don't mind, come back sure, of to course. come back to your joke about you know this is going to prioritize the Looney Hour over over all kind of content and explain to and and make the case why that would be a bad thing. Not because of course, I, I mean, of course, not, it's a bad. I mean, yeah, sorry, no, Stephen no, Keith. But, of but, course, it's a bad thing. Yeah, no, but a bad thing for you. Not just because, and and that's that leaves us aside. This may be the best program there is out there. <laughs> but here's the here's why this is a risk, and why getting the government involved in in this way uh, creates creates risk for all kinds of content creators. Because you know, if if the government basically says they're going to prior this con this your particular content is the one that gets prioritized, then what ends up happening is a lot of people start seeing this in their feeds, even though they might not be interested in these kinds of financial issues, and so they don't click on it, or if they do, they watch a minute or two and say, "Hey, this isn't for me." What that does is send a signal to YouTube or to the other platforms that this isn't good content, that when people are presented with it, they don't watch, and so what will happen is you might be prioritized in Canada. But globally, what will happen is suddenly the, the YouTube algorithm will say or the TikTok algorithm will say it's not great content. When people see it, they don't click on it and it will be downgraded globally. 
Now, if you're focused exclusively on Canada, that might not be a big issue. But for many Canadian creators, their market is the global market. You know, the way they're okay. making a living online is speaking to all these different play, all, you know, 2 billion users, not uh, 38 million users. And the risk that this creates is that they're going to be downgraded globally. That's now, a really, really important distinction. Thank you for making that because I, I, that's something I didn't know at all. Um, that's... Yeah, no, and, and that and that's why there is the, these real concerns that where you see creators because intuitively say, hey, wouldn't it be an, a good thing? And I think politicians said, wouldn't it be a good thing if you were prioritized in Canada? And once they bet, once they, you better understand the global model and how it is that many creators make money uh, online on these services, you understand that it's a bad deal to trade, you know, Canadian dollars for global dimes, and that's essentially what ends up happening. Now, on the, the quickly on the telecom side, yes, I, I was opposed to, to the Roger Shaw merger because it seems to me that eliminating a competitor just doesn't result in more competition. And, <laughs> um, you, know, the, you, you know, we'd seen this movie before in Manitoba with the, the Bell MTS merger. And so we know how this is going to end. We know that there will be some short-term honeymoon gain where there'll be a desire to sort of so to reach out to try to grab some of uh, the, the available customers as there's a bit of transition that invariably starts occurring. But in the longer term, it's going to mean consolidation from a jobs perspective within those two companies. And from the perspective of consumers, it means there's a consolidation in the marketplace. And you know, the, you know, the, the simple reality is that you can make a lot of different excuses for why it is that Canadians pay some of the highest rates in the world when it comes to telecom services. You can say that uh, we've got a big geography, but then again, Australia has a big geography. I mean, you can make all these different arguments. The, the, the simple point is we don't have the kind of fierce competition that you do see in other markets, particularly given the absence of some of the very large global telecom players. You know, it's a it's a cozy environment. We can think back a number of years ago to when there was thoughts that Verizon might enter into the marketplace. And the big three did everything they could to keep them out. And it made, I think, for them, economic sense to spend almost on an unlimited basis to keep the mark to keep that company out of the marketplace. And you know, we're we've been paying literally, I think consumers have been paying the price ever since. Thank you for that. Um, I just have one more question. I mean, just from a like a sort of regulatory standpoint, why do you think? I mean, is it possible to have a foreign uh, telecom uh, company be a major player in this country? Is it there's is there like a security reason why that doesn't happen? Is there like a legal uh, sort of charter of rights and freedoms reason why that doesn't happen? Is there sort of a, just a lobbying, an excellent lobbying group reason that doesn't happen? Or why, I mean, is that possible or? So it so it is possible. Um, and that itself is a change. And so if we were to go back earlier, telecommunications was one of those areas that was viewed as that, you know, for national security and economic reasons, you did need to keep foreigners out, so to speak, you did want to ensure that it was Canadian owned. We've seen some changes in that regard, but there are a couple of barriers. There, there is the ability certainly to for uh, a foreign owned entity to come in. It has to start relatively small, uh, but it can grow to whatever percentage is possible. But we all know that um, it's pretty tough at this stage to create a greenfield telecom company uh, under 10% of the marketplace and suddenly become one of the dominant okay. players. It's very difficult to do that. So then the question becomes, well, could they buy one of the big three? And, you know, I think part of the, you know, that, that was part of what was the, some of the thought process a number of years ago. I think the reality is with the way the market has evolved, it's ex it would be exceptionally difficult to do that. Not because of the telecom assets, but because of the broadcast assets. So broadcast sure. assets still are, all just still do have very strict um, foreign ownership limitations. So if you're thinking about, I want Bell, well, Bell isn't, of course, just not just Bell and, the, and their communication side, but their CTV and a range of other sorts of services. Those ones are pretty much off limits. And so the ability to, to strike a deal that's going to make economic sense and have to divest large parts of the company because you can't own it as a foreign owned entity makes it in many respects a non-start. Okay, so moral of the story is we'll be continuing to pay the highest uh, telephony, mobile phone and internet prices in the world um until something materially changes but you don't have much hope is there anything else you wanted to share um first of all thank you very much um before I, I i um just as we're winding down thank you very much for for taking the time i know you're obviously um busy and, and i really appreciate it if, um can you just if you want to plug the name of your podcast um just before we go 
Um, oh, yes. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Uh, so the podcast name is Law Bites, uh, B-Y-T-E-S, and I get privacy commissioners and uh, government officials and academics and others who are involved in this. That might not be everyone's cup of tea, but if sure. you're interested in digital policies, I do that. I uh, blog, as you mentioned, at, at michaelgeist.ca, and I'm on Twitter at, at mgeist. Sure. And is there anything else you think we should know just um, going forward on Bill C-11 stuff that, I mean, is it is it over? Is it done with? Is the fight, has the fight been lost? I mean, or is this something that we should, I mean, should we write to our MPs if we really object to sort of the nature and, and the tone of the legislation? Is there something that we should look out for or something that we've missed in the conversation that you thought that would, would be really important to contribute? There are still issues with C- C-11, although um, the window to sort of lobby your MP or raise it with your member of parliament, I think, is over. Um, I, yeah. There, there, <laughs> I there's, at, at this stage, there's the ability to let them know that if you know if they voted for this legislation, that's something uh, you weren't all that happy about. And uh, it's something that might be remembered come election time. Um, but the bill itself is now before the regulator, before the CRTC. And so there are, are a couple of, of avenues for participation because while the bill sets out the broad framing and creates some of the kinds of issues that we've talked about, there are still any number of different issues and and reasons for concern, I think, coming out of this legislation. And so how it gets interpreted through the CRTC is important. The policy direction that the government is likely to provide very, very soon um, is also, I think, of interest. And both do offer up the ability for people to speak out. And so Eventually, the government will come out with a policy direction. There will be a period of time where Canadians can comment. And so that is one more opportunity at the political level to say, you know, I'm not comfortable with what you're trying to do here, if that's the case. Uh, With respect to the CRTC, there will be a lot of hearings. They are talking about at least nine different consultations on different elements of this bill. There are three that have already started. But I have to say it hasn't started in a particularly promising way. They set insanely short deadlines for participation, Uh, end of June for some and mid-June for others. So it was literally just a matter of weeks. That has resulted in a whole series of groups, both supporters and critics of the legislation, calling on the CRTC to extend the deadlines. And uh, and I actually did submit something as part of that as well. And, and I have to say that I think it's left some people feeling that there's there are elements of theater here that, um, you know, is the cake already baked and you can say that you're interested in what we want in, in what we think and what we're concerned about and how you go about implementing this. But if you don't even provide a practical opportunity for people to really pull together some of their thoughts and submit it. Well, then this is just theatrics where you're just kind of ticking a box to say, oh, yeah, yeah, we did that consultation. And then you're doing what you thought you'd do all along. Sir, you may not be familiar with uh, central bank digital currencies. You're dominating. um, Rich, let me have a question. Come on here. (laughs) We fight sometimes in the loony hour. We don't do it very, but very quick. Once a quick question, I do want to, you know, try to make this worst possible. Uh, First of all, when when this went to to parliament, was it voted on party lines? And then the, the second question is, is is it designed so that just just say your podcast gets throttled are they required to tell you you're getting throttled or do you just have to figure it out yourself yeah so so thanks for those questions in response to the first question it, it was very much along at the house at the house of commons it was very much along party lines so Obviously, the Liberal government supported it, supported by the NDP and by the Bloc. It was only the Conservatives that were opposed to it. Um, Once it went to the Senate, it gets a little more complicated because the senators are not uh, uh, aligned with parties in every instance. Uh, And what you found there was that you had, and this is actually important for the purposes of what we focused on with C-11, you had... The the conservative senators they were by and large opposed to opposed to the bill and were looking for changes. The independent senators, many of them appointed by the current government by Justin Trudeau, many of them were looking for changes. And in fact, they they were convinced that there was a concern with respect to the regulation of user content. They proposed a change. It passed the change. It, it passed the full Senate, and then the government rejected it when it went back to the House again, voting along party lines. So the Senate um, is a bit more of a mixed bag. In the House, it was. Very very much along party lines. In terms of notification, no, I mean, there, there's no required to notify how you're treated in an algorithm. Um, and as I say, it's not specific content, it's, you know, general types of content. But um, in the same way that you're not informed now how you're treated in the algorithm, you wouldn't necessarily be informed later if the effect of changes to the algorithm as a result of seeking to comply with regulator expectations were that you were either um, promoted or demoted. The loony hour down to one listener, just Rich's mom. 
um, well, Professor Guys, I appreciate you uh, coming on to the show and, and, like I said, taking precious time out of your day here to 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 share your thoughts and uh, certainly encourage everybody to go check out. We'll put some links uh, to your to your blog and to your podcast in the show notes. Uh, but we do appreciate you coming on the show. Oh, my pleasure! Thanks so much for having me. Pretty, uh, pretty insightful guy. It's uh, I don't know about you guys, but the Canadian content, other than the Looney Hour, kind of sucks. <laughs> Like you go on like can, can, Canada's Netflix versus like U.S. Netflix, for example. I don't know. Like this is a big difference. But one thing I, I heard, I, I love this conversation, by the way. I, th- I think it's outstanding. And it's I think it's really it's a great opportunity for more people to, to become aware of it. Uh, obviously, it, it seems like it's just being jammed down the, the Ottawa throat. It, it's happening no matter what. But what I heard from this conversation, and we didn't really get into this part of the conversation, is the power that the CRTC has over this and when where it goes. And I have no clue how the CRTC is created, who's appointed to it, how often does it change? Do, do they have a group that will oversee them? But it, it again, like you, you keep going down this road of who is the arbiter? Who decides, you know, what is misinformation and what isn't? So it's whatever they do, it's going to be used for something different at some other point in time. Not say they, whoever's in power, it doesn't matter what color shirt they're wearing. So it's, you know, it's a slippery slope, basically. It's a slippery slope. Yeah. It's a simple, slippery slope. All right. Well, shifting gears, speaking, you know, and also speaking a- of slippery slopes, we, <laughs> we have a uh, Bank of Canada bet coming up. And I know Rich is going to slip and slide out over this one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, we're gonna get into that. So, I mean, kind of frame frame it up for this week is really Canada's GDP print, right? So, uh, obviously, coming in well above expectations. Um, I don't have the number in front of me, Rich. Was it three point one percent in Q one on an annualized basis? Yeah, I mean, I was sorry. I was looking at the quarterly number. Sorry, I screwed yeah, that's up the here. Quarterly, but then I think the Bank of Canada's like initial projections, like in their monetary policy reports, I think they were projecting like two point five percent growth on an annualized basis. So, anyways, it's just upshot is well north of sort of the BOC's expectations. It obviously trumped all these other economists' expectations. So now there's the narrative going around. You got a couple of big bank economists coming out uh, saying that the Bank of Canada needs to begin hiking interest rates. Uh, we've talked about our, our good buddy uh, on the show here, uh, Derek Holt at Scotia Bank, who's been uh, the most vocal um, proponent against the Bank of Canada, <clears throat> says, um, and I quote, it's time for Governor Macklem to take the gloves off and take action instead of just talk. Uh, so he's, he's calling for uh, more rate hikes from the BOC as soon as uh, next week. So can't you just envision how all these economists, you know, surrounding the Bank of Canada with signs up, you know, hell no, we won't go, you know, and stuff like that. <laughs> Again, I think it's outstanding that, you know, the platforms are available for people to hear their thoughts on it. Uh, well, I feel like I'll you've share- never had, just sorry to chime in there, I feel like you've never had so much sort of like vocal economists coming out and like usually like everybody sort of toes the, the line which is like okay everybody's in agreement that like this is the path and i feel like you've just got so many people that are kind of like arguing with each other about like what's the right thing to do should we be waiting for for interest rate policy which invariably has long legs uh to, to sort of filter through the system it's interesting that it doesn't seem to be a, a very wide uh, agreement about what where what the Bank of Canada should be doing. Remember, like today's Bank of Canada is is different than your grandparents' Bank of Canada. Uh, but what I mean by that, like even over the last five years, it, it's changed completely because now you know, everybody has access to the data. Everybody has a strong opinion about it, what they're going to do. And and bef- before that, there was there wasn't a lot of public pressure on what a central bank should be doing. Uh, even from within the commercial banks, if you read any of the economic reports, you know, from, from, from different, uh, you know, big bank teams back in the eighties and nineties and O and, and O it's like, they were pretty passive, right? There was no reason, you know, to be a bit aggressive, you know, towards the bank of Canada. And as we're seeing today, that, that's changed dramatically. And the fear that Canadians have today when it comes to the Bank of Canada, you know, we we all have houses, we all have debt and stuff like that, is that, you know, we, we don't want rates to go up anymore. But then you have the other 
side of this discussion that are people that they don't care what's what the impact is on the economy or not. They just want to be able to say, yeah, we should raise rates again because that's going to crush inflation. But, you know, as well, we trying time, to get into the housing market. Yeah, <laughs> but it's uh, it's interesting, by the way. So the Q1 data, like it's guys, it's, you know, Q1, Rich, just three months, Jan, Feb and, and March. Yeah. Yeah. But what was the April monthly data? I know that came out as well. That, that was it was a, wasn't it a forward estimate. It wasn't like it's not like set in stone. It's uh, the forward estimates point. Was it point two, Rich? Oh, I don't know. I don't look at those for. I don't look at the monthly data for GDP. GDP should be done quarterly. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no. Canada's are they? They do the the monthly. Uh, data. So does so does the UK. I, I I don't get it. But anyway, what about uh, Rich? I think um, part of you dissect that GDP. This is kind of your job. I don't know why I'm doing it, but uh, January was a 0.7 percent increase in GDP. So it actually was the largest driver of Q1 growth was January. So there's there's been the argument from some of the bank economists that, hey, listen, guys, most of the growth was actually emanated from January and things have kind of slowed since. Again, maybe not slowed as much as everyone expected, but no doubt has, has slowed. Yeah, so it's 0.7 for Jan, 0.1 for Feb, and then 0.0 for March. Um, I mean, back to your question on like, you know, the, the difference. I mean, I think it's I think it's competition. I think it's competition for views. I think it's really good that people are trying to differentiate themselves and not just slavishly following what the government is saying. Um, read read that. <laughs> read into that. Oh, no. What CRTC. You will. <laughs> read, read into that what you will. I mean, I think it's really important that I forget his name. Holt, uh, Mr. Holt and other people um, have said, you know, this is going on, and, and we know his views on population growth. We know our, my views on inflation. I think it's great that people are, are out there and, and sort of um, sort of putting themselves out on the line and, and arguing about what's going on. I mean, I think it's what, what I've always looked at for me. What matters is the only thing that matters is productivity growth. You guys have heard me say this before, and the way to describe productivity growth is GDP per capita. And for me, it's just again where GDP per capita didn't rise. So now you're so that's now you're at three quarters in a row. I mean, the rise was ever so slightly, but basically virtually none. So now you have three quarters in a row where GDP per capita is down to flat. And, you know, I mean, in a, in a different world, maybe a less politicized world, that would be that would be obviously viewed as, as, as sort of already in a recession. And, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, which is where you when you have such intense population growth, it's very, very hard to sort of have a your your not your your real GDP growth fall um, quarter on quarter, and that's why I think the focus needs to be on per capita. And there, the record is not good. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, this is actually a brilliant point because, like, if you actually look at like a lot of the, these reports on this number, is um, is cons- one of the one of the reasons for the stronger than expected GDP growth was consumer spending, because you're just adding in all these new bodies into the country, and so in Q1 we uh, we uh, Canada added almost. Um, 150,000 new permanent residents in the first quarter of this year. That's the most on record by a very wide margin. So the population continues to expand, thus consumer spending obviously increases. But we've talked about, I think we talked about it in last week's show, right? Where it's like, how many people have seen, you know, one third of mortgages as of right now have seen a mortgage payment increase. Those one third of people that are being impacted are obviously reducing their spending. You know, Scotia Bank came out and said uh, that their variable mortgage holders have reduced their discretionary spending by 10%. So like you're yeah. seeing that portion of society, which is indebted, is cutting back on their spending, but you're kind of like superseding that with your massive population growth, which is kind of inflating these numbers. And so, yeah, it looks- That's exactly right. It's ridiculous. Uh, sorry. Well, that's, I mean, that's the point. And that's, that's this, inf- and you said, the, you said the, the perfect word, which is it's inflating these numbers, e.g. it's inflationary, meaning your nominal GDP growth will be okay. And your real GDP growth will be okay. But that's, that, this is why we're going to, I mean, the, maybe <laughs> this is the right segue for Keith, but like, this is the next thing is like, if you have so much inflation, what is this Bank of Canada meant to do? And Keith's going to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe this is a lot of misinformation, so you shouldn't be. Uh... <laughs> uh, so you know, one thing to realize with, with the Bank of Canada, you know, they have their own estimates and projections, what they and, and across a whole number of different data points we're looking at. But they also just like the minister, just like the Department of Finance, they also consider a lot of estimates from the private sector as well because you know and then you you marriage them all together and you say hey okay this is maybe the range of outcomes 
that, that are coming up. Uh, so, Steve, you made a really good point. You know, January was, was pretty strong with the data, and then it got a little bit weaker. Uh, so to give you an, an idea, for the next three quarters, the quarterly GST, GDP estimates from the private sector are 0%, minus 0 0.7, and 0 0.4. Sounds pretty good. Yeah, so it's pretty flattish, okay? And, uh, however, we have to realize and appreciate the uh, the private sector GDP estimates have they've been uh, lower than actual data. Like we they've been behind it because of the population growth story. But the Bank of Canada will be looking at that. The CPI data for next three quarters: three point six, three point one, two point seven. So again, we're we're trending in that direction from the data that they're looking at. Um, so then, you know, this sort of brings us to, hey, what are they going to do? Oh, I'm sorry, is the private sector is forecasting CPI at 2.7? Uh, yeah, in Q4. Q4. This year. Okay. I mean, yeah. that would think surprise a lot of the inflation hawks if we actually got to that number. It would be interesting. This that's is funny. What... If we get down to that level, a, a lot of people will be angry because they want it to stay high because it's a, it's a great, you know, conversation. You know, like that two, no, two you're, you're arguing within... with neighbors on the internet, well, people you don't know on the internet. Oh man, that's that's a favorite pastime of mine. The inflation, the Bank of Canada's inflation range is between one and three percent. Right. So if they're at two yeah. seven, I mean, that's kind of mission mission accomplished. If they get there, which is obviously again, I'm sure, Rich has some some thoughts on that. But so the uh, do you guys know the estimates for next week? Do you want me to run through them, or are you? Go for it. Well, where are we now? Just to remind people, and then maybe where so we're, we're what the estimates yeah, are. Yeah, so we're at, we're at four and a half right now. So just everyone remember, you know, we were basically down at zero, you know, in, in the depth of the uh, of the pandemic. We've gone from zero up to four and a half. Rich, just like that. <laughs> you can't hear it. <laughs> you can't hear it? No, Keith snapped his fingers. We can't that was a good one. That's the best snap I've done in a long time. Uh, Fonzie had good snaps as well. You know, he, whoa. Uh, okay, so we, we're at 4.5%. Uh, next, this is Wednesday. So, no, this is Thursday. So next Wednesday, we have the Bank of Canada meeting. And um, right now, the estimate is basically no rate hike. There's a, there's a percentage chance they will hike, but it's not a slam dunk. And it's not a slam dunk that they're flat either, but it's leaning more towards the, there is no hike. So we call this, it's a live meeting coming up. So, which means we have a live loony hour uh, bet here. We didn't bet last time because we know we, no. we are all confident. Hold on, with Keith, can you, can you give us the June and the July uh, rate hike probabilities as of right now? Again, these are always constantly fluctuating for the audience that's listening, but uh yeah, yeah, that's, that's fair because people should know what you know everyone can see. So uh, there's a uh, it's about a fifty five percent chance there's a, a rate hike by July. So if we're going to get a hike, most likely it'll occur in July, and if it doesn't occur in July, it will most likely occur in September or October. But the market is thinking we're going to get another quarter point hike at some point this year. So right now they're saying, hey, it's you know a matter of when, not if, right? Yeah. Which right? is interesting because you could get a couple data points that come out in the next six weeks and those 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 expectations will obviously readjust. But yeah, totally agree. Yeah, I I think they really are now monthly. Um so Steve, you're pretty hot on this. What what is your guess for uh next week? I think Tick Tiff Macklem, I don't think he's got the cojones. I think he's gonna <laughs> remain on pause. He's long a couple pre-sales and uh, he's done. Well, that makes two of us then. Sorry to be boring because I think uh, I think as uh, I think as the summer hots up and all this energy data comes back, and um, I think it'll be really interesting to see. But I, I think that the I think I think there's one more rate hike in him, but I don't think it's next next time. Keith, yeah, I, I'm with you guys. I, I uh -oh. now, my perspective is a bit different. I, I think the commercial banks are, are telling them that. You know, they are seeing a lot of stress out there on under loan books. Uh, and they tell them that, hey, if you hike again, you know, we can we can manage it, of course. They, they absolutely have the capacity to manage this. So they will. But I, I'm, I would imagine, you know, they're suggesting, you know, to the Bank of Canada saying, why don't you hold off a bit more? So it seems like then we're pushing off then to the July meeting, right? And we'll get more data leading into it. 
But like Keith, I mean, this is obviously not a normal cycle. Um, it hasn't really been, feels like it hasn't been like a normal market for, you know, since pre pandemic kind of thing, but typically speaking, when you see these central banks going through their, their rates uh, hiking cycle, usually once they pause, the next move often is usually a cut. So it, it would be interesting. It, it's, it's certainly a, a decent probability that pause could be a hike in July, but it, it would be fairly unusual from a historical context. Yeah, I mean, using the Fed as the, you know, the barometer for this, not the Bank of Canada. Um, they, 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 once you end the cycle, or you reach the peak or the trough, that that's what it is. And then, because you know, I tweeted a while ago. I just says, I said, hey, the Bank of Canada, you know, they, they they're now stopped hiking rates. The next move would be a cut. That's what I said. And a lot of people interpret that to say, oh, next meeting they're cutting. And that's that's not what I said. That the next decision would would be a cut. Yeah. So we're still in that phase right now. But we'll see where we come with with the data. But you are right, Steve. Like once it, it's hard to get going again. Like years ago, uh, back in I think it was the London. Olympics was it is that 20, 2012 it, it was yes, and uh, so the women's marathon uh, I think it was an Irish lady or English lady I forget her name but she, she held the world record for the marathon and she was hoping to get to get gold in it I don't remember her name Some, somebody will come up with it they'll find it anyway so I remember uh, I was offshore then oh maybe it was before 2012 <laughs> Boomer yeah. stories. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those stories, right? <laughs> it's very important when. But the point was though, at, at one point there, she you can tell she was struggling. She had a very unorthodox running style as well. And she actually stopped running. And it was like, oh wow, like you if you stop, you're stop, right? You're 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 just finished. And uh for whatever reason she stopped. And then all of a sudden she started going again. And the media just went nuts, right? Here she is. It's, I think her name was Paula. Paula is somebody. Anyway, she started going again. And guess what happened? She collapsed? It, it stopped again, right? She just couldn't oh, get okay. going. So okay. that's my point. Central bank policy. Oh. And uh, if you stop <laughs> running, you, you've you stopped, right? You're not going to. I thought that was going to be like a, she, she finished the race first place or something. Yeah, me too. No, no, I think it's, I think it's, it's really hard to, uh, anyway, we know we'll have the fed coming up as well. Uh, is the, was the fed, when is the next fed meeting guys? Um, this is your wheelhouse buddy. I know I'm hitting some buttons here. We'll see. Drum roll. June, June 14th. June fourteenth. Um, so, any more Bank of Canada stuff? Because I have a couple of no. I mean, I think I think just to quickly like last sort of chime in on there, and we'll sh we'll shift gears. I I just think like I don't know about you guys. I mean, Keith, you're you know I'm sure you've got a lot of clientele there that are successful and running businesses and providing different sort of anecdotal perspectives. I mean, I've got a interesting batch of clients myself and just like i don't know it's just interesting like these conversations that you're having like people in the m a space that are running successful businesses etc cetera, etc cetera. like everyone's like yeah things are slowing down our revenues are down uh it hasn't been the greatest year and like i even look at it from the housing front like i know we've talked about in the show like hey like housing's ripping like prices are up yes prices are up but, like this isn't like it's not a booming housing market you know like volumes are very mediocre you basically have a situation where like yeah there's an element of people that want to move that need to move. And because there's a 20 year low in new listings, which is incredibly unusual and probably not sustainable because of that, people are running into multiple offers and prices are getting bid up, but it is not a speculative demand boom where there's just all this demand gushing into the housing market, waiting to bid prices up. It's just like, there's literally just not enough inventory currently for sale. And so I think at some point this is going to moderate back out, um, cause mortgage rates are still high and it's expensive and it's hard to qualify. And so again, I'm not calling for, you know, lower prices, but I'm just saying, I, I think what we've seen, we saw this spring sugar rush, uh, which we tend to see almost every year. And then we just had very, very little supply. So I think like people are freaking out cause like housing's taking off again at the bank of cash to start jacking rates. I just don't think that's really the, the story here. Well, there's another little wrinkle here, because I mean, there's a CFIB, which we've talked about, um, and that's the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses. And their their barometer came out 
comes out every month and you can you can look at it. They talk about wage plans, uh, capex, spending, employment, hiring and firing. And for and there there was there was actually kind of optimistic. So just to quote, Canada's small business optimism index has now been on the rise for seven months in a row and is the highest level in almost a year. Um, when then labor shortages we've discussed continue to bite. So you know it's it's I don't think it's it's it, I think we've talked we talked talk, talked this, talked about this um, off air before we get on. It's like there's a lot of conflicting data. Whether it's um, your your point, Steve, about housing, or my point about the CFIB and 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 businesses actually feeling relatively okay, I mean it's it's it's, it's messy out there. So it yeah. seems like then if the Bank of Canada really wanted to get inflation to come down, they don't need to raise rates. They simply have to stop the population from growing, right? And then you know try to increase supply of, of housing, and that would alleviate a lot. Imagine of it. that. Yeah, imagine that. But you know, that, I mean, you, but you are right, Stephen. We we have a lot of conversations with with clients. Uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people are looking to buy buy a home. They've been saving and, and waiting, and you no, know, it it can be a bit. You know, it's it's a waiting game, and then when you finally, as you know, there's a difference between a home and a house, right? A house is an investment, and a home is a home to make. Um, and and some people are finding uh, a place, and they're they're pulling the trigger, and they're really excited about it. Uh, the common conversation is uh, how much higher will the Bank of Canada go? And, you know, th things can change, but maybe they have another 25 point hike in them. But then, you know, you can also be exposed to credit spreads, you know, blowing out and that will happen. So if we, if we do get a slowing economy coming up or the, the bank's mortgage loan portfolio, so you know, it, it begins to deteriorate. You know, you can still have rates going higher without the Bank of Canada hiking. See what I mean? We, we can have yeah. that coming up. Hey, hey we'll get more information wanna, next week. We know that. You want to know is an interesting stat just on that on that housing front because you were talking about like a home versus a house, right? So like what I said, there wasn't like this demand boom. Um, what what we've seen again is like yeah, people that want to or need to move because they got family and they need their kid, they want their kids to go to a certain school. Like people aren't going to delay their lives for like two and a half, three, four years for like a, a housing crash that may or may not happen. Like people like most people just want to get on with their lives. They want to like have a home to live in. Um, it's the investor side of purchasing that has, has, has dropped off. Now in Canada, we don't have good data, but in the U S this is uh, from Redfin just this week. Um, they said that um, real estate investors in the United States purchased 48.6% fewer homes in Q Q1 of this year versus Q1 of last year. So there was a 48.6% drop off in investor home purchases, investor house purchases uh, in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so again, I don't have the data for Canada because we don't collect that information, but I can tell you anecdotally, uh, the investor side of it is, is a trickle of what it used to be over the last two to three years. So next, sort of leading into this, so this will lead into a, what will happen with the Bank of Canada. So let, let's just, um, every now and then I take notes, you know, for, for the podcast. <laughs> so you do prepare. <laughs> Sometimes I do. Yeah, yeah, it's actually fun. But 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 events outside of Canada, you know, sort of led me to do this. But let, let's just imagine this, this scenario now in Canada where um, the, the economy is starting to decline. We do get a bit of a, a sharp drop. Is that a soft landing and say we go minus 2% or lower for economic growth? Uh, bank provision for credit losses really starts to ramp up. So double from current levels. Bank stocks, close your ears, everyone. <laughs> bank stocks drop another 20% from here. I think some bank stocks are down maybe 15, 20% anyway from, you know, the, if I'm ticking the top, of course. But you know they're down. But say bank stocks come off another 20, 30 percent. You get that mortgage rates are skyrocketing. Keith, you're really at the CRTC after us. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and the I don't know if the CRTC will understand some of this stuff we're talking about. But anyway, uh, it's positive if you are listening. <laughs> uh, and the Canadian dollar, all of a sudden, with with this, is down in the low 60s. It's so no, it you know it, it's down about you know 12, 15 percent. So now all of a sudden the Bank of Canada, you know, as you can, for what I just described, it, it's not a nice economic environment you know, at, at all. And all of a sudden the Bank of Canada, they have to hike rates to instill confidence back. Because also in Canada, if this is happening, if Canada, you know, is going down that economic, you know, tube, um, 
you know, you and I, and so we start taking, we start selling anything Canadian dollar that we can, and we're buying USD or maybe Rich is buying sterling or you're doing something, right? And so that environment though, that is, and people say, well, that ain't going to happen. However, that, that's exactly what's happening now over in Sweden and Israel. So, so this week, so, you know, I like to look at the whole world and, you know, because I think it's all synchronized at this point in time, but, but this week, all of a sudden you're getting these floaters that have been put out and they're, they're not leaked, you know, they, they are leaked in, intentionally, but both the, uh, the Rick's bank and, and Sweden and the bank of Israel, they, they suggested that they might have to start hiking rates to stabilize the currency, which really means to attract foreign investors to put their money on deposit in Sweden or Israel, or to encourage locals to keep their money in those, in those countries. So that this isn't the environment that we talked about before that, hey, if you run into a currency crisis, which develops because of all those factors that we just talked about, um, you know, then all of a sudden they have to make a decision. Do we start hiking rates? And if you do that, then you have the dilemma because that would slow the economy down further. You know, it's sort of, you, you get trapped in this scenario. But that, that's what caught our, our attention this week. And I know we've talked about it before on, on, the, uh, on the podcast, but now it's happening in, in real life. And it's from outside of Canada, of course. So that's, you know, maybe in Q1 next year, um, maybe say we're 25% of the way through that, scenario i just painted but we you know we, we could easily do something like that and, and that's what people should think about you know how do you properly position yourself you know just in case you know that this this stuff happens there seems to be a lot of uh eyes now obviously on the fed um keith there was like who's that who's the fed guy out today we looked up his name earlier and we didn't uh Nobody remembers them. Mm, no. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, one of the yeah. vote, one of the voting members basically came out and I think leaked again. Keith seems to me like those are kind of intentional leaks, basically that uh, suggest the Fed will will be on pause. Uh, here Jefferson. In- Jefferson. Yeah. Jefferson Phillip. says the Fed's going on pause. Philip or his friends. Some of his friends called him Phil, but Phil <laughs> Jefferson was was out. So yeah, uh, Mr. Jefferson there. So Mr. Jefferson's calling for a pause um, from the Fed again. Could could they restart the following month? Certainly a possibility. But um, Rich, there's also a, you know we we talked about data that's maybe a little bit confusing, but we got like this whole spew of labor uh, data coming out of the U.S., um, which kind of muddled the picture. I mean, it's funny because like if you go on Twitter, right, like people will basically pull out the charts or the talking points they want that align with their particular view and and they'll basically share and retweet those. But th- there's a whole bunch of conflicting data right now that I think is making somewhat compelling arguments on both sides of the narrative. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's low, I mean, we just rattle off some things. Thing, the thing that jumped at me today was the challenger layoffs. So there's a company that basically aggregates um, what, like the layoff announcements, um, you know, a couple months back, you know, we, we know there was a bunch of tech layoffs. And so it spiked on that data. Since then, it has now come off of quite a bit. And then today it jumped up up again. I mean, this is, I think, I mean, we, that people have talked about sort of wage growth data that's sort of to, uh, to sort of slow down. We've, people have ta- discussed the jolts. We've discussed sort of claims, which is like weekly claims, initial claims. So whether or not, you know, you go on um, uh, on unemployment insurance, um, you know, that we've ta- discussed uh, whether or not people, labor participation rates. I mean, the, I think when at the end of the cycle, it's there's no clear direction. And I think that that's what we are starting to get to now that there's some there's some pushback on whether or not we're getting to, you know, people should be ignoring the um, ISM number, which, by the way, came out today um, that it's below 50 and it's not signaling recession. I mean, I think one of the one of the discussion points I think we had like last year at the end of last year is that, you know, because the labor market is so tight due to demographics, I think it might take a long time. But we are starting to see slowly but surely cracks in the labor market armor and as we did you say surely (laughs) yeah but we said many times is that the labor market is sort of is a lagging indicator 
and this is what we started to see. So softer wage growth in America, wage growth in Canada is abysmal. Um, we have the jolts number. I can never remember what the jolts, do, but basically the openings. There's the quits and hire. So if you're really confident about the labor market, you might quit your job ahead of time. Um, you know, we talked about claims, which are still low, but starting to ratchet higher. There's the the challenger job numbers. So we're starting to get some cracks in the armor about the labor market. And, you know, back to your point about the Fed pausing, I mean, the Fed's a dual mandate. We know inflation is more or less slowing down. If you do get some pronounced weakness in the uh, non-farm payrolls, which is coming out, I think, tomorrow, right? We record this on a Thursday. Um, it's always the first Friday of every month, um, except for occasional exceptions. If we get some real weakness in that number, then I think you you will absolutely see a pause. To confuse things, the ADP, which is the accounting company or accounting software company that pr produces sort of their own estimates, absolutely blew out the estimates, uh, blew somebody's head's estimates, uh, whatever, you know, like last week. <laughs> so, you know, so, but the point really just to boil it down is that you're getting a lot of crosswinds. And I think that that's what happens at the end of a cycle. Yeah, yeah. I think you, uh, you, you got Steve excited then. <laughs> Yeah. You're gonna get so by the way, like with, with off the the Fed, here. you know, it, it's you know, everybody references, you know, Paul Volcker, you know, back late 70s, early 80s. He's the guy that, you know, broke the back of inflation by hiking rates after he failed the first time, then he yeah, we do it again. But you know, like in the central bank world, they everybody wants to be Paul Volcker, right? Until they get the opportunity to be to be Paul Volcker. <laughs> And and that's that's what's happening with Powell right now. Like he has every reason in the world to stop, but yet if you're objective about it, and he's gone from zero to to five, right? That's where we're now with the America is five percent, I think we are, and uh, nothing is broken yet. Data is getting a bit better in his favor. So if you know if if the uh, Fed guys were listening to the loony hour, which I'm sure they are. Everyone's sitting down, you know, with, with their drinks, listening. Uh, that continue to hike rates. Like things have not broken, and there's not an indication. Like a lot of things have bent, of course, you know, but it, it's still there. So I, I'm still under the expectation that the Fed will will hike. That's what's going on today. Of course, uh, it's a full on risk on day in the markets today because of our friend Steve. What's his name? Jefferson, Phil, Phil Jefferson, yeah, Phil, Fred uh, Jefferson, yeah, <laughs> Phil su suggested that you know there will not be a, a rate hike next month, but as Rich pointed out, like the, the data is a bit softer and stuff, but they still have room to run, run with it. We don't do a, a Twinkie bet on the Fed, but maybe we we should because that should be more of a live meeting. Yeah. Oh well, I think there'll be a lot of Twinkies. On the well, we did none of us. Next... Not, we disagree. We all agreed, didn't we? <laughs> I on think the pause yeah, for well, Reggae I mean, Canada, so we have to push it. It could be a whole bunch of Twinkies getting devoured next week. Uh, That's right. I mean, I think that, uh, yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of volatility over the next six months. I think there'll be plenty of bets. Keith, just to quickly touch on your point there about Vol Paul Volcker, um, your buddy there, well, I'd love to have him on the show. I think we've been chatting about it for a while now, Mike Green. Um, I got a lot of respect for him. I think he's an incredibly intelligent guy, but he put out a good sub stack the other day. Um, which, you know, he basically argues that he thinks that the Fed is, is, is overdoing it and actually creating, uh, inflation. So he actually, there was a good quote here that he put in his, uh, Substack piece that says, quote, the initial impetus for accelerating inflation in 1978 came mainly from the food sector with some help from mortgage interest rates. The further acceleration into the double digit range in 1979 mainly reflected soaring energy prices and once again, rising mortgage interest rates. Finally, mortgage interest rates carried the ball almost in itself in, in the early 1980s. And that was from Alan Blinder in uh, 1982. Which is interesting because we've talked about mortgage interest rates component in Canada. And the um, UK. And the yeah. UK. It's been huge. I think it contributed to what 0.6% of headline CPI last month in Canada. So, and a significant, well, this is why it's so, I mean, Keith says this all the time. This is why it's important to sort of have like a global or holistic view of markets, even though you're Canadian, because you'll see 
things that rhyme with other countries, whether it's Keith's point about raising interest rates to protect the currency, whether it's your point, Steve, about, you know, um, interest payments and mortgage payments affecting inflation and and their, their contribution. I mean, you, I mean, these economies are not totally different, um, whether, you know, you talk about um, commodities, whether it's Australia and Canada, and their, the relative sensitivity to commodities or oil or what have you. I mean, this is why it's important to look at these different countries. And right now, I mean, like the commodity space is everything is is coming down. It, it's, I think I was going to ask you guys about that. Yeah, I think that gas is troughed here at this point. Yeah. But uh, some of the main food ags, like uh, soy and, and wheat specifically, they're they're coming off it a little bit. So you know that that you know central banks they see that stuff as well. And we talked uh, about Dr. Copper, which is normally an indicator of global growth and demand. That's come off. Yep, there she was. What's what's your what's your outlook on that? Do you think this is like um, a pause or a, a timeout in sort of the you know what could be a commodity super cycle? Or how, how are you looking at this? Like, I I mean that's always like the next potential wave of your second in, inflationary wave coming. You know, end of this year or next year at some point. But to me, that feels like a real risk. I don't think we've necessarily solved. Uh, the energy situation. Uh, but clearly, you know, oil prices are down, commodities are all down. So that's providing at least a temporary relief to the inflation picture. But it seems like a real risk that those could still inflate higher, if, you know, 12 months from now. I, I think we're uh, commodities are coming lower because it, it is signaling that we are going to a, a slowdown or a recession, depending on which economy you're in. Uh, like Germany, for example, they're now yep. in recession. Yeah, nothing to do with commodities, of course. You know, there's China's there's PMI a- came in worse than expected. Keith, take that. Yeah, for what there's, it's there's worth. lots of yeah. Again, like there's lots of data to suggest that you know growth's going that way. But but Steve, though, with the commodity question, uh, I think we're on the verge of another super cycle in in the commodity space for a lot of uh, different reasons. Uh, and what we're seeing now, though, is, is instead of a secular bottom, we're getting this cyclical low that is being developed by, you know, less demand, some supplies increasing and, and stuff like that. So for us, you know, we we, we thought this would be lowing. We, we thought the commodity space would trough in Q2. And, uh, and we've been vocal about it. Like, I'm not using hindsight with stuff. I think now it's, it might be pushed in. Maybe it is at the end of Q2 that it is bottoming here, but maybe it goes into Q3 a little bit. And, and again, it's a great indicator that you know growth should be slowing. And then sort of following that lower, it, it should be equities as well. So then you get the, the opportunity coming up from an investment perspective is, is that both equities and commodities be, begin to bottom fairly close to each other. There might be a quarter of a two difference there but like if you look at nat gas in, in the u.s like it's been it's been testing this two dollar range now for for a few months and i think we're up as high as what 10 maybe 11 bucks cubic feet i think rich you can put i remember when here. twitter was sharing all the nat gas charts yeah it was like uh it was pretty spectacular but i you know again with commodity they can only go so low and then it's especially with nat gas there's only so much you can store Right. right. And I, I suggest that as soon as it starts getting hotter now in, in the uh, in the U.S. with summer coming, you know, the ACs get kicked on again, you know, blasting and we'll see some of that. But uh, yeah, I know commodities, whether it's copper or you know, different parts of the energy space and, and ag. So what we are we have been positioning, you know, for a bottom. So we've been, you know, sort of adding to those. You just call and we bottom? closed that position. We see remember the one we've been he did. talking about. He did. Yeah, call the bottom. <laughs> we, we what? Did you you call the bottom, bottom Keith. <laughs> in oh, in commodities? Yeah. Well, yeah. Over the next two quarters, it should bottom. <laughs> you know what they say? Uh, Don't go picking bottoms. You'll come out with stinky fingers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one. But we but we closed that interest rates uh tactical trade on Friday. And then that, that worked out really well with the timing on it. But uh yeah, again, like we're into this. Like markets tell you things, right? And especially when you start pushing them all together. So if if equity, if commodities are bottoming or going lower, trending lower because economic data is is getting weaker, all of a sudden next we're going to start to see the narrative that companies' earnings are going lower. And you're seeing that in some some spaces right now. That's happening. And then you know the the fundamental guys I'm doing an eye roll. By the way, the uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, well, there, lower, I mean, but that lower I mean, their PE ratio to, and stuff. I mean, that's for me to step in because what I think is really interesting is revisions. Uh, so there's things called earnings revisions. It's an aggregate of analyst expectations on on whether sales are going up or earnings are going up, and across sectors, basically all the earnings revisions are starting to really ratchet higher and into positive territory. So and and then, but to your point, Keith, about different signals. I mean, as commodities are starting to go lower. We just broke this like, you know, I love the arbitrary line of 4,200 and the S&P 500. And so you have like two demand driven, growth driven indicators actually going in different directions where you have the stock market starting to make higher, higher lows, which means it's trending higher. And uh, things like commodities, even though commodities have zero inventory globally, um, whether it's in Shanghai or LME, comm uh, commodities like Dr. Copper, which are usually a, a, a signal for demand, they keep falling um, and, and signaling going lower. So it's it's messy it's but you make getting... another another good point as well rich and i know we're sort of flopping around here but but again our view has not changed we, we think commodities are going lower because of economic uh demand but from an equity perspective you can also have a scenario where all of a sudden hey margins can we can maintain margins at the same level yeah. now or go higher because a lot like chemical companies for example like they're very exposed right. to energy prices it's so like the old guys like the duponts and those guys you know they're all of a sudden they're like oh wow maybe we could make some money coming up here Remember, guys, plastics, that's the future. <laughs> <laughs> what movie is that from? The, that was uh, the, the Graduate with, with Dustin yeah, Hoffman. That's, that's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah, I remember after, like, after his high, like, after like grade eight or nine, you know, we used to go watch that in the afternoon back in the 60s. That was fun. Oh. <laughs> We don't, need to, we don't need to recount that. Uh, that's those right. Days. So let's, uh, it's a good place to, to wrap it up. Um, as always, guys, we appreciate the support here on the Looney Hour. All we ask is that you share this episode with at least one friend or one family member. Leave us a review. Uh, help us to, to beat the uh, CRTC algorithms and uh, continue to grow the community here. Uh, we'll see you next week.